Um, so Mitch, I want to start, we sort of got the overview of what you're doing, but the core of, of what you're doing is this concept of public entrepreneurship. Can you explain to us what that is? Sure. Um, so I start with this question of, <clears throat> can we solve public problems anymore? And I come around this answer of like, yes, <laughs> so that's good news. <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes. Uh, but the sometimes is, to me, is like if. If we move from what I call probability government, where we do things that will probably work, but they lead to sort of mediocre or sort of middling outcomes, towards something that I call possibility government, where we actually do things that, that only possibly will work, which means they probably won't work, which is the realm of the entrepreneur, right? So like 75% of new ventures fail, but the few that succeed turn out to be transformative in our lives and ideally in society. And so public entrepreneurship for me is about how do we actually get towards possibility government? How do we use the skills, the traits, the practices of entrepreneurship to bring about uh, new solutions to old or sometimes new public problems? Government tends to be risk adverse. It's sort of rewarded for being risk adverse and sometimes it's sort of designed to, for, for things to move slowly. And so it seems that this entrepreneurial attitude is somewhat revolutionary and sort of against the status quo. Yeah, so, um, so I, people say all the time that government is risk averse, and I, and I was trying to hope and think that it wasn't, right? Because I've started this course on public entrepreneurship, and if, if I'm doing public entrepreneurship but government is risk averse, then what am I doing? So, Deep questions. Deep questions. Yeah, I know. Deep, deep questions. So I actually went looking. So I went looking into the research, and I'm not an economist, but I can read a few economics papers. So um, it turns out that you're right. Government is risk averse. Like economists have actually looked and found out that people who work in government, in public service, are actually less likely to even take chances than all the rest of us in general. Okay, so, ah, uh, well, um, what do we do with that? Well, I would I would say two things. Like, how does public entrepreneurship then still work, even if risk aversion is true? One is, we're actually all risk averse. Even the entrepreneurs in this room are are risk averse. It's not that they're risk seekers. Right, by that logic, they would actually prefer their enterprises to be more risky than they are. No, they actually have a set of skills. Uh, they run good experiments. They use prototyping to get started a little bit quickly. Uh, they go to their uh, users faster than government typically does to get good ideas. So there's things they do to actually buy down that risk. And so when I say public entrepreneurship, I'm not inviting government to go ahead and actually take more risk. I'm asking them to take on riskier projects more skillfully. So there's one difference there. The other thing is that it's true. It's true that, that, that government has this long history of risk aversion, that in some ways our government's been designed to make sure that we don't take too much risk. And some of that is actually quite wise. But it's also true that in the long history of our government and every government, there's a strain of experimentation. Right? I mean, George Washington in the first inaugural address says this is an experiment finally staked in the hands of the American people. He calls it an experiment. From before its founding, from during, from afterwards, it's always been an experiment. Government has always been. Right? Um, you know, and I talk about, like, my work is around invented government. People say, like, well, didn't, like, Aristotle do that? Well, <laughs> maybe he did. But, um, but that means somebody invented it then, too. So there's always been this dual strain of, of some amount of risk aversion and care and caution, which there should be. But there sometimes has also been this strain of experimentation. And part of my thinking is that we actually need to, to, to go hunt uh, more of that and go uh, return to more of that. If we're going to get to possibility government, we are gonna to have to do it together. And what I mean by that is we are gonna have these public officials who are a little bit better at taking on riskier projects, but we're absolutely also gonna to have to have a public that is willing to give them the permission, the encouragement to do that, and actually co-produce with them. And part of that public is gonna actually absolutely, Linda, have to be those entrepreneurs who say, I wanna, I wanna start a company that's gonna uh, help police manage their uh, records better so that we protect witnesses uh, uh, better and, uh, and, and secure streets better. Par someone's gonna have to start a company that says, I wanna secure the vote better. Someone's gonna have to start companies that say, I wanna solve affordable housing better. A lot of that activity is gonna happen in the private market. And so we're gonna need these entrepreneurs to step up in public spaces. And that's gonna be fraught. Right? We're already seeing that what happens when people race entrepreneurs race into the public sphere without a certain amount of uh, awareness, humility about, uh, about how it's different from their purely private work. But it can't be that we just uh, siphon them all off and say we don't want your private entrepreneurial activity because then we're not going to solve all the problems that face us today. Not housing, not inequality, not the environment, not public safety, not security, not democracy. We, we won't. So we need them. And so I love being at Harvard Business School because we can, we can use the entrepreneurial skills and tactics and we can invite in these inventors and builders who are at places like Harvard Business School or at business schools around the world and haven't been told you could actually invent and build inside government or you could invent and build for government and come help us do that. 
You are a thought leader in this area, and it's really exciting that you're here and that you're sharing these ideas with us, but it comes from uh, learning in the trenches. Uh, Ed referenced that he was in the trenches with you, and this book that you're, you're starting, this isn't the cover, but this is what it's called, we, we the Possibility. You start with a story where you were in the trenches with Ed and with Brendan um, after the marathon bombing, and that was an example where you wanted to not do the status quo and not do the safe thing, but you wanted to create something that was more impactful. Mm -hmm. Can you take us through that experience? Yeah, I mean, I don't have to tell anybody in this room what that day was like, um, but, uh, but one thing that happened that afternoon after the day was shattered was that people from all around the world started wanting to help, what can we do? Uh, the mayor's feeling those phone calls, the governor's feeling those phone calls, and one of the instincts that the mayor had and others had um, was we actually should set up a new fund to channel this generosity towards all the people who are uh, going to end up needing to be the recipients of it. At that time, we had no idea who, how many. Um, but what we did have an idea about was that the old way of doing this, the traditional way of doing this, was to actually have the, uh, uh, the established institutions in town. In this case, it would have been probably the Boston Foundation in town establish a fund in order to channel these monies. But and that's the trusted institution. That's the, that's, the, that's the trusted institution that would be the typical way of doing it. But what we also knew was that that didn't really work very well in the cities that have had unfortunately had to do it. So like it had been something like 100, and I don't have the number exactly right at the moment, but like 140 something days since the horrible shooting at Sandy Hook. Not a penny had made it from the people who had given it uh, to the parents of those mm -hmm. kids that were killed. And it wasn't gonna ever bring their kids back, but it was intended for them. And so Mayor Menino, the governor, others felt very strongly that we not do that again. Um, so we decided we to start our own new thing. Now, um, that morning, uh, the next morning, right, uh, Paul Grogan, the head of the Boston Foundation, is very uh, much not in agreement with that idea. And, and, and um, I know why, right, because he runs the trusted institution in town. He has the safe way of doing this. Like, certainly there is a way of doing this that he can do quite well. And our belief was just, well, we could just do it better if we did something new. And he told me, you can't start something new. You'll raise less money. So he was probably right, right? Like statistically speaking, entrepreneurial speaking, like probably what we were going to do was going to fail. But it possibly would mean more money faster to the survivors uh, of the marathon and the families of the victims. So uh, people know the story of the, uh, uh, of the One Fund. And um, it's not flawless, but uh, it did get started very, very quickly. 24 hours after the bombing, it's up and running. Um, literally on a, on a PayPal link and a, and, a, and a post office box the next morning. Um, and and 60 days, uh, 75 days later, it gives out $60 million. That's the largest, fastest private relief effort of its kind in the history of this country. And so afterwards, I'm sort of left with this question, which is like, um, well, so, so one, one more thing, which is after, a, year, a year later, uh, Patrick, uh, uh, Patrick Downs and Jess Kensky would become close friends of mine, but were survivors of that event, uh, standing together as newlyweds, uh, asked me to tell them the long story of the One Fund. And afterwards, they heard about how it went, and again, not perfectly, and they would have their um, say about that, but unbelievably uh, quick and generously. Uh, they, they said, you have to tell the story to more people. I said, it's not my story to tell. I wasn't there. I didn't save anybody's life. I wasn't a first responder. They said, you have to tell people government can do new things. Okay, so then I'm left with this question, which is, is it, is it the first thing I was told, which is government can't do new things? Or is it the second thing, which is government can do new things? And which is it? And so for every day in the last, um, in, in the, in the last half decade since that event, I've spent wondering about basically which, which is it, and trying to figure out under what conditions and how can we actually government to do new things. Yeah, so the mayor's office of newer mechanics um, uh, uh, almost didn't happen, actually. So, the, <laughs> so like many things, um, uh, Dot wanted to kill it. No. Um, the, um, there's actually, the, the, I received a, I wasn't working for Mayor Menino. Uh, I worked for him once briefly in his third term, and then uh, he was getting ready to run for his fifth term. And I got a phone call one day, uh, uh, and I was told, I don't, I've never told a story, I hope it's okay to tell. Um, but Definitely. it's okay. So um, uh, and I get a phone call, and they say, Mayor Menino's gonna announce for re-election next Wednesday. And his speechwriter's written him a speech he doesn't like. His ad guy's written him a speech he doesn't like. His pollster's written a speech he doesn't like. Will you write him a speech announcing for his reelection? And I said, well, it's my bachelor party this weekend. Um, <laughs> I'm on a plane to Chicago, uh, actually to see a Cubs game. So wait, talk about wait till next year. Um, so, and I've got three hours, I can, I'll see what I can write then. 
one of the things that we, I wrote in that speech and he, he said um, uh, uh, in announcing for his fifth term was that basically the generation that gave us Facebook wanted to engage in public, uh, you know, in, in public ways more than ever before. We should harness that energy. We're actually going to bring a wave of innovation. So get this, a wave of innovation to City Hall, that, uh, unlike uh, any since uh, people brought water into people's homes. <laughs> <laughs> but this, these are your words. These were well, they were my words, and he said some of them. Um, <laughs> bless his heart. Um, so, um, but the point was that there was a there was so so in there. There's two key ideas about what what's new mechanics going to be. One was that we can actually harness the energy that's within within our public. Right here was a mayor who met half the people who live in the city. Let's ask them for their help. Before we get to what new mechanics is around innovation or anything else, the fundamental piece of it is about engaging the public in the co-production of city work. Okay, so we are all urban mechanics, he ends up saying, uh, when he takes his inaugural address in his fifth term. We're all urban mechanics, all of us, all of us. That's one key piece. The other was, yes, a wave of civic innovation, that part of it was going to be we had to usher in new things if we were going to solve the big problems that the city faced. And so that office, the mayor's office of new urban mechanics, became one of the first big city innovation offices. And I, I think that its two biggest ideas, you asked what was at the core of it, I think its two biggest ideas were that one, yes, we're going to need to do, uh, you know, take on risk or things if we're going to solve the real problems we have, but we're going to need to do it together. The vision for the, for the innovation district for the seaport was it's, it's, it's 2010, we're just coming out of basically the Great Recession. And, um, and Boston has a chance, if we take it, to put ourselves again in the forefront of cities in this country and around the world and to make sure that we continue to build new companies, uh, create jobs, and, and grow prosperity, and ideally, uh, and importantly, share it. And if we, do, do, if we do nothing at this point in 2010, other cities are going to race ahead. At that point, uh, New York City was getting its act together uh, and was attracting a huge amount of startups and venture capital. And so the vision was, could we take uh, this unbelievable uh, resource that, that Boston had, which was its physical capital, a thousand acres on the waterfront where the harbor had cleaned up and the Greenway was there um, and, all the, and the highways had been built, take this amazing physical resource and take this amazing human resource we had, which were the people who, who come out of our universities and who live in our city and, and work in our neighborhoods, uh, and take the financial resource, which was still like more venture capital uh, per capita than any place on the planet, and concentrate that in a place to help uh, push Boston forward uh, 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 again. If you look at basically all the great innovation nodes on the planet, they're not just one place. You can't just have just Kendall Square. You can't just be just Kendall and Longwood. It would need to be Kendall and Longwood and the seaport, and after the seaport, the leather district, and downtown, and after that, other places. Boston would have to become much more innovative and, and, and home to entrepreneurial companies. And the mayor was adamant that that, that that land not be just come you know, anywhere USA, that we do something special with it. And so that was the vision. And people didn't think it was going to happen. I remember Scott Kersner, uh, I think, was insistent that the parking lots would stay basically forever. And to Scott's great credit, uh, after they didn't, he said, I didn't think this was going to happen. It did in, in part, in large part, because Mass Challenge went there uh, when no one else did, uh, basically put a flag on the ground and said, uh, we, this can be someplace different. And also, it was sort of of the thing. It was The way we did it was all entrepreneurial it, itself. So the normal way you would have started a district like this would have been to spend like four or five years recruiting some big company to come move there. And I mean, you, know, you, you could do that. Um, you most likely would have been waiting four or five years and still nothing would have happened. And so instead, you say, like, instead of doing like the big established, you know, typical, normal, slow thing, what if we try this experimental thing, which is there's these two people uh, who have this idea. Why don't we just give them, you know, give them, um, thank you, um, <laughs> thank you. Some, you know, some basically blank space in a building that's not finished and see what they can do with it as a test, right? So we had all these uncertainties. You know, people said no one will go down to, to that area. It's too far from South Station. The VCs won't go. The IP lawyers won't go. The software engineers won't go. Well, those are all testable hypotheses. So Mass Challenge says, I'm willing to basically run those tests. I can run them pretty cheaply. Give us some free space, and we'll show people come or they'll come. They did. And so it wasn't just an effort to attract entrepreneurs, but it actually was a way to do it in the way that entrepreneurs would. I think if we're going to get to possibility government, I think if we're going to solve public problems, the first thing that we're going to have to have is more ideas. I know that sounds crazy because you think like the world is flooding in ideas, and probably the reason we haven't solved things is just because um, you know, we're just too political or too partisan or too bureaucratic or something. But I actually think, um, you know, entrepreneurs see problems as opportunities, like the evidence that we need more opportunities, that we have still plenty of problems. Okay, so I think we need more ideas. So, 
So in the like design thinking language, that would be this notion of like, first let's go create choices. Before we all get hyper-focused on making choices, let's go create a lot more choices. And I think one way of finding more choices, finding more ideas, is to look all around the world around us. In every place, in every industry, things that have nothing to do with government. There might be a mobility solution waiting for you in the way that fish swim. I mean, I don't know. But the point is, like, how do we basically go and look everywhere so that we can open up this funnel of ideas and then think about, well, how can we make them work? I, I think too often we start with, oh, that, you know, we, these six ideas, none of them will work. Well, let's back up a step. And I, I mean, when I go around the world or hear from, from, from people around the world, you, you know, they're doing amazing things. In, 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 in Bratislava, in Warsaw, in Stockholm, um, in, in, in Mexico City, um, in, in Mumbai, like all over the world are they trying and testing things. And I think we have a great story to tell about what we're doing, but I also think there's other things that we can learn from other places. Lynn, I'd go a step further, which is I, I think they need to do more than look at what's, what works, because what's, what works isn't working, right? Like, if, I think in government, too often the reaction is, let's go find out what the best practice is. Like, we would have that experience. Like, oh, we want to solve a problem. Ask one of, one of the team, why don't you go see how we should solve that problem? And then you get back a memo that says, here's the best practices. Here's what San Francisco did. You know, I mean, no offense to San Francisco, but do I really want to follow what they've done on housing? Like, that doesn't seem like a good, so it might, it might be best practice, but it's not good enough. So I think we look out at the world and we use it to generate our own new ideas about what may be even better than what's currently being offered. I don't think we're aligned, and I think, I think we're in, at risk of actually being farther and farther apart, the private entrepreneurs and, and public government, and I think we need to bring it back together. I mean, I think there's no better example than the sort of, you know, the sort of so-called Mark Zuckerberg hearings, you know, two springs ago, when, when Senator Hatch asked him, you know, like, how does Facebook make money? And everyone, you know, not everyone, right? So a lot of people basically snicker at, like, oh, what an idiot Senator Hatch is. Like, how does he not know? I actually think it's more of a Rorschach test. If you, if you work in technology, that's your reaction. But if you work in government and civil, civil society, you look at Mark Zuckerberg and say, like, how did he not know what he was getting into? Right? I actually think there has to be a bridging back together on both sides of an understanding from both angles of uh, how do we actually work much better, much better together. I, I think we can work in a joint uh, effort on public entrepreneurship, on possibility of government, but it's going to require a coming back together um, that we haven't seen in too many places of late. And you're telling us that there's more we can do. What, what can we do? We work at companies, we work in government, we fund companies. Yeah, I think um, you can be possibility citizens. I mean, we're gonna need these possibility leaders, these elected officials, these appointed ones who take more risk, uh, but they can't do it unless you give them that permission, that encouragement, and your co-production. They cannot. So you're gonna have to change the way you vote. You have to vote for people who are actually willing to experiment. You have to demand that they know what they're doing, that when they do, uh, they don't waste too much time, too many resources, that they have a portfolio of experiments so that some of the stuff actually works out and changes our lives for the better. You're gonna have to vote differently. Some of you might have to run for office yourself and, lead, and, and, and then lead differently. You're gonna have to co-produce with them. So there are people in governments all around the world who want to do citizen-centered design, human-centered design, but they're gonna need you to show up and show them how do you use your mobility, your, your, mo your, your mobility solutions? How do you use your housing? They need you to come. There, there are people all around the world who are trying to crowdsource ideas about how to solve vexing public problems. They know that out in the end, end of that distribution, somebody who thinks they have no expertise on this idea uh, actually does. I mean, there's a famous example a colleague of mine uh, wrote about uh, you know, when NASA was trying to solve the problem of solar flares. It wasn't, they weren't NASA scientists who solved that problem. They were like some, somebody who had like ex experience in like microwaves and, and radio waves. You have expertise that you don't know that government needs yet. But if you can engage with them, your ideas are gonna help them. So you need to help contribute your ideas. You have to help give them permission. And then, and then the other thing uh, is when we all try to scale these ideas, uh, we all need to be engaged around, uh, around managing that scale for good and for bad. You know, it can't be the sort of passive sort of like, oh, my privacy is, 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 is being violated. It's got to be an active, what do I want to do about making sure my privacy is protected? As citizens, we need to develop a set of regulations, vote for uh, political uh, officials, put in company leaders, all of us actively, who are willing to manage that change at scale. And if we just stand on the sidelines, it's going to happen in ways that are very pernicious and dangerous. And if we get engaged on ideas, on experimentation, on scale, I'm hopeful that we'll get something much, much better. A challenge as big as inequality, is that something that you feel you can really start on the local level and sort of make improvements there, or do you need to start at the federal level? I mean, I think for us here, we have to start, we have to start here. Um, I mean, we, we should, in our own lives, we, there's only so much we can do about what's going on mm -hmm. in, in Washington. I mean, we can certainly vote and campaign, and we can even run ourselves. 
Um, not me, but other people in this room. Um, wait, wait, was that, was that no, an announcement? But, uh, <laughs> definitely not. There, there are some um, no, uh, de no, definitely not. But, um, <laughs> but be precisely because I actually think there, that there are things that we can do locally. Um, and, um, and, you know, cities have often been that font of experimentation, even on this topic. And so I would say we should turn our attention to what we can do here and try to solve inequality here. And be much more creative and much more aggressive about solving that problem here. Um, you know, it's easy, and, and, or not the easy, but easy enough to sort of, you know, lob, lob critiques down in Washington. But I think we have to all ask ourselves, are we doing enough? Are we being um, entrepreneurial enough around this problem? Of all problems, here in Boston, we could do more, and I think we should do it here. You were talking about a little bit of this, this culture of risk taking, this sort of this attitude um, and this culture of, of believing that our government can do something and that we should try. But there's also the risk that if, if you have it, that you don't keep it. Mm. You know, so how do you keep this, this culture of, of trying, of risk taking, of believing that we can, do, we can do hard things, we can tackle big problems? Mm. That's a really good question. I think part of it is, does go back to um, producing the evidence of the thing we're trying to see. You know, we can't, I worried about in the early days of, of public entrepreneurship that there was a lot of vaporware in the space. There was like a conference circuit and people would go around and talk about public entrepreneurship, but they hadn't really produced a lot of it. And then you start to the same people at the same conference saying the same things and you start to wonder, you know, is, is, there, we, is there a thing? Is there a thing? So I really do believe um, that, uh, that we have to have, you know, we have to have the, the things, the new products, the new services. We actually have to transform people's lives. I was talking the other day with some people who lead uh, kind of, they brought design thinking into one, one of the big na national governments in another part of the world, I won't name which country. And they were, they were saying we've got like 15 P, you know, dissertations worth of information about how important design is in, in government. You know, but how do we convince people? You know, how are they gonna you know, hold on to the culture and not let it swim away? They, not their words, Brad's, but the same question. I'm like, well, they need to see the evidence in their own lives. Like when you fix housing for them, they will believe you. Right? When you solve mobility challenges for them using these tools, using design, they'll believe you. But if it's just another you know, post-it notes and a whiteboard and nothing's changed, they're not, why would they believe us? So I, I really believe we have to produce the solutions. Uh, and then we can hold on to this culture. And, and, and that'll be a big, big part of it. <laughs>